You're listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. We bring expertise on international affairs from Stanford's campus straight to you. I'm Michael McFall, host of World Class and director of the Freeman Spogli Institute. My guest today is Colin Call. He is our co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation and a senior fellow here at FSI. From 2014 to 2017, he was deputy assistant to the president, that is President Obama, and national security advisor to Vice President Joe Biden. And before then, he had served in the Pentagon during the first term of the Obama administration. We're here to talk about Ukraine, your former boss, kind of the policy process more generally. Colin, thanks for coming on World Class. That's great to be here. So let's talk a little bit about policy formation first, and then we'll get to Ukraine, and then we'll get to what the vice president was trying to do when he traveled to Ukraine famously. In fact, you must have been on that trip, right? That, I, I that. was. Yeah. Well, so first talk about policy. In the Obama administration, there's an interagency process. At least there was when I was there. I presume yeah. it kept going after I left. The vice president was integrated into that session. I think it was different in the Bush years when Vice President Cheney had his own team right. off to the side. Tell us about, well, let's just focus on Ukraine as you're getting ready to review the policy. What happens first before you eventually engage with the vice president to do something related to policy towards Ukraine? Sure. Just a little context for your listeners. So I was the vice president's national security advisor from October of 2014 through the end. Through So I, I think I left the White House grounds about 12 hours before President Trump entered the grounds. So a few so, months after Russia had invaded Ukraine right. as well. So, so the, right the, 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 the Maidan that. revolution happens, starts in February, yeah. then Yanukovych eventually flees to Russia. Right. This is also the time in which Russia illegally seizes Crimea, and then they start to stir up trouble in the Donbass and in eastern Ukraine. So I come in kind of a few months into the story. Right. What's interesting is if your listeners are paying attention to the news, it seems very much like a he story. That is that somehow the story is about Vice President Biden. But for those of us who worked in the Obama administration, it's not a he story. It's a we story in the sense that we had a kind of traditional, what I would call Scowcroftian national security process in the sense that we had layers of interagency meetings. So meetings where representatives from the NSC staff and the vice president's staff, but more importantly, from the State Department, from the Department of Defense, from right. the CIA, from Treasury, et cetera, would get together at various levels of seniority and work through policy proposals. If there were disagreements, iron those out and then tee up options for the principals, the cabinet, right. and right. for the president. And, and let's walk yeah. through those layers for our listeners. So when I was there, and I yeah. think things didn't change, it started with the IPC. Correct. The, the Assistant e Secretary level, right? Right. The Assistant Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary, kind of depending on the agency. Well, that's true. Right. right. So kind of the lowest level of political appointee. So like the right. lowest level senior official. So the Deputy Assistant Secretary or Assistant Secretaries, and they would get together and typically in a meeting chaired by an NSC senior director like yourself when you were the senior senior director uh, for Russia before going off to being the ambassador. And they would tee up issues, frame them. Usually the senior director would task, say, the Defense Department or the right. State Department or USAID or Treasury to come up with options that were kind of in their lane. Right. And then the NSC would integrate those options right. into a series of three, four different options. They would then get raised to the deputies committee. Deputies. And I sat on the deputies committee as the vice president's national security advisor, I was a standing member of the deputies committee right. representing his staff. That would be chaired by the deputy national security advisor. And at that meeting, you'd have all of the deputy secretaries or undersecretaries, depending again on right. the issue set. So deputy secretary of state, undersecretary for policy from defense. Right. Or they, a lot of times uh, at treasury was the undersecretary right. because you were dealing with sanctions and counterterrorist finance and things it. like that. But essentially, kind of that just below the cabinet level. Right. So you all get together in the White House Situation Room. For hours and hours. Hours and every hours. Every day. No uh, windows. <laughs> no windows. <laughs> Lots of coffee. Yeah. Right. m &Ms. That's right. So uh, we were... <laughs> hashing yeah. out the policy, we, right? Hashing out the policy, trying to get the disagreements to the side, or at least surfacing them so that they would be clear for the principles and crystallizing the various options into a set of two or three or four integrated options. They would then get raised to the principles committee. Right. PC. The PC which would be chaired by the National Security Advisor. In this time frame, that would be Susan Rice. Right. And that would be all the cabinet officials and the vice mistaken, president. Right. So he's already a member of the principals committee. That's correct. And then that exact same set of individuals also made up the NSC, that is the statutory NSC, the National right. Security Council, right. which would be chaired by the president. So essentially, Susan Rice would move one seat over at the head right. of the table, and the president, President Obama, would sit at the head and chair a meeting to make the final decisions on these things. So this is not a process the Obama administration created. This right. was a, a largely a process that 
with some modification is held since Scowcroft was the National Security Advisor for the first Bush, George H.W. Bush administration. And even in the Trump administration, our colleague here at Stanford, H.R. McMaster, ran a process that would be recognizable. Right. I think some would argue that process kind of broke down about 50 feet from the Oval Office, but the, right. for the rest of the government, it was essentially recognizable. And so Got Ukraine it. was... So you were doing a lot of meetings on Ukraine, probably, right. 2014, 2015. Again, for context for your listeners, I would kind of categorize what the Obama administration was focused on down the home stretch into kind of two categories. One was these kind of big ticket affirmative agenda items. Okay? okay, So like the president was very focused on first getting a deal with China on climate that turned into the Paris Climate Accord, the trade negotiations that culminated in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Iran nuclear deal, right. the Which opening... Which also were very involved in. Correct. Yeah. The, we'll do that podcast right, another later, day. Later, right. <laughs> Only the easy <laughs> subjects today. Uh, <laughs> um, but also the opening to Cuba and a number right. of other big pieces of business right. that were not, for the most part, crisis-driven. These right. were big affirmative agenda. The Iran thing is a little bit, was kind of a mixed bag of, a, it had a little bit of a crisis dynamic. So that was one basket of goods, kind of this affirmative agenda. And then there were a set of issues that all emerged in 2014, the kind of crisis issues yeah. that we spent a lot of time on. And the three areas that I would focus on there are the rise of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, Syria. the Central American migration crisis, which really culminated in the summer of 2014 when all tens of thousands of unaccompanied minors right from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, the Northern Triangle countries, showed up in our southern border, and Ukraine. Ukraine. And what's interesting about those three crisis items is that these were all things that Obama said, hey, Mr. Vice President, you take the lead on these, right? Right, and he was the point person. He was the point persons, person. And right. you mentioned Cheney's office earlier, and you know, I'm, I won't speak for them, but, but certainly by reputation, especially in the first term of the Bush administration, there was a sense that Cheney had built up a kind of parallel NSC, that the right. office of the Vice President was had a much larger national security staff than it had ever had before, and that they were kind of running their own plays. Right. And sometimes they were in line with the president and the National Security Council staff, and other times they were not. This was actually something that Vice President Biden very self-consciously wanted to avoid at the right. beginning of the <clears throat> Obama administration. So when you were at the NSC, one of the first things that Biden did when he came in was he told the president, look, I'm actually going to give you some of my billets back. That is, some of the Office of the Vice President National Security billets I'm going to give to the National Security Council. I didn't even know that. And in exchange for that, A, I want to be in every meeting. Right. And B, I want to be able to draw on the NSC staff as right. part of my staff, too. Well, so, that's interesting. again, it's not a he, it's a we. Right. And just a footnote, then, because yeah. I was working at the White House in 2009, two data points that illustrate that. Number one... The first big speech that we gave on foreign policy, and especially on Russia, yeah, was immediate. delivered by Vice President Biden yep. and included the word reset. Yep. And I participated in writing that piece, yep. right? Because and that you'll was recall, before. You'll recall, though, that there are actually two memorable parts of that, right? One is the announce of the reset, but the other was that there were certain red lines of Russian behavior we wouldn't Absolutely. tolerate, including if there was any aggression that would violate national sovereignty or Correct. the integrity of borders, et cetera, which everybody looks at the first part and forgets forget that second that. part. I don't forget that, right. that second part. I remember it well. And not only then the second data point, because it's then related to when you come in, in 2009, President Obama went to Russia yeah. for his first meeting with Medvedev and Putin. And that same summer, Vice President Biden went to Ukraine and Georgia. And I was on that trip. And that was part of, we're going to have one message here. We're not running separate plays. So That's sorry right. for the footnote from the past. No, but this is actually relevant because I actually think one of the reasons why the vice president was as effective as he was. I mean, partly it is he's he's great at generating relationships with foreign yes. leaders and using those relationships to advance the national interests of the United States. Right. But also because... No foreign leader ever doubted that Biden spoke for the president. Great point. You know, and right. so sometimes people can even doubt whether a cabinet official showing up is freelancing a little bit or getting out right. ahead, of, of leaning a little forward. Nobody ever doubted that Biden was speaking for the president because he had a close relationship, because there was this kind of division of labor between the two of them on foreign policy. Right. And because in a lot of instances, he was the last guy in the room. So he had, you know, the vice president doesn't actually have a lot of constitutional authority. The office of the vice president essentially has the reflective authority based on how close you think he or she is to the president. Right. And in this case, you know, I think they were seen as very close. So on the Ukraine topic Yes, back topic to Ukraine. Specifically, what were the topic, what were the main issues that you're dealing with? I mean, some of them are obvious, but go through them as you recall. So I would break them into three categories, at least in the amount, what the vice president spent the vast majority of his time focused on. One was the anti-corruption piece, because as you know better than most, Mike, you know, for all these former Soviet republics, when they privatized all these state-owned enterprises and, yep. and basically all these rich guys seized these companies and generated enormous 
wealth, huge disparities between them and, and the rest of the people. Like in the post-Soviet world, you had enormous inequality and corruption right, right. emerge. Inequalities and corruption, by the way, that Moscow continued to exploit, especially under right, Putin, right. kind of weaponizing corruption as a form of influence, which mm -hmm. I think not enough people appreciate. And nowhere was that more true than in places like Ukraine. And the sense was that Ukraine was not going to be able to stand up on its own two feet as a free and independent country if the cancer of corruption was not addressed. And this right. wasn't a Biden policy. This right. was a U.S. policy. In fact, it was a policy that the West as a whole embraced, right. especially the European Union and international financial institutions like the IMF, right. that for Ukraine to remain independent, sovereign, and solvent, right. they had to address corruption. So one right. basket was corruption. We should come back to that. Okay. The second basket is what I would call marriage counseling. <laughs> And in this, a lot of the in this, marriage counseling, ma marriage wow. counseling. You guys did in the, a lot. specifically in the time period where I was the national security advisor, you'll recall that the president of Ukraine is Petro Poroshenko, and then the prime minister is Yatsenyuk. Both officials elected after the Maidan revolution. Just Correct. To be clear. Rival political parties. Right. And hated each other. Right. <laughs> So you have a president and prime minister, both are kind of a co-executive arrangement right. almost in Ukraine. Right. I joked about the marriage counseling thing, but a lot of what Biden was doing was making sure that the government of Ukraine didn't collapse right. because of infighting among the Yatsenyuk and Poroshenko. Right. And so he's calling these guys all the time on the phone and trying to mentor them and shape and shove and cajole to try, and in large part because on both the corruption piece and the governance piece, that the argument I heard Biden say repeatedly to Ukrainian leaders is, look, there are a lot of folks in the West they would just as soon abandon Ukraine, right? Because it's a lot of it's a hassle, it's right? A hassle. There are there are there are companies and there are governments. Right. They want to go back to doing business with Russia. That don't right. want to take the economic hit from right. sanctions. And they um, were all sanctioned because Russia invaded, invaded in, right? Because they right. annexed Crimea and because they were stirring up separatism in eastern Ukraine. And the the argument was that look, guys, if you're not whiter than snow, if you don't prove that you're going to crack down on corruption and you can govern, you'll be abandoned, right? right? And like. So help me help you. Help me, Joe Biden, as the representative of the U.S. government, help you maintain the support of the West and of these international financial institutions. So that was the second bucket, which was governance. And then the third is what I would call the Minsk bucket, but essentially trying to make sure that the United States, Ukraine, and important European countries like Germany and France were all on the same page on Minsk vis-a-vis -vis what the Russians were trying to pull. And right. it's it's complicated. And explain and Minsk just yeah, in two well, words. There so. essentially are two different Minsk agreements, right. but in a nutshell, these are agreements that lay out a sequence for de-escalating the conflict in eastern Ukraine and the Donbass and restoring Ukrainian sovereignty over that territory and its borders. And there were a number of steps, ceasefires along the line of contact, elections inside of the Donbass, restoration of the border, and getting Russian troops and equipment out. Even though everybody could agree on the steps, it was actually the sequencing of things that mattered, right? So what Russia always wanted was to have elections first. And what we were always pushing for and what the sequence of Minsk actually read was, no, actually, you have to get the Russian forces out and restore the border first or you right. can't have free elections. So that might sound like a distinction without a difference, but it was actually quite meaningful which sequence was. So right. making sure that we and the Ukrainians and the Germans and the French were all on the same side. The vice president played a big role in right. that. Right. And, and here, actually, this is where uh, the vice president and President Obama tag-teamed a lot, because as you know, President Obama had a very close working relationship with Angela Merkel, the right. chancellor of Germany. In any case, this was actually, the Minsk bucket was probably the place where kind of the OVP, the Office of the Vice President staff and the NSC staff were kind of in working together and uh -huh. in parallel on these things. But I say that because, you know, a lot has been made of the corruption piece because of the impeachment right. inquiry and the allegations, the false allegations against Biden. But this was really only one of the three major baskets of that activities that he with was on doing. Yeah. Well, let's hone in a little bit on the corruption piece. Yeah. A lot's been said about the removal of Prosecutor General Shokin. Yeah. Did you ever meet him by chance? No. Uh, you guys never did? You know, it's been reported that $1 billion loan guarantee from the United States was being withheld unless the Ukrainian government and the RADA, because eventually they voted the Ukrainian parliament, removed Mr. Shokin. Yeah. Tell me what that's all about. Like, what was going on there? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think this is actually one of those areas where language can be confusing for listeners. So when people say so-and-so demanded the removal of a prosecutor, right. that makes it sound like right. your local DA, right? Your <laughs> right, local, right, right, like right. a local yeah. lawyer. Right. The easiest way to think about this for your listeners is that the prosecutor general in Ukraine is the like the attorney general in right. the United States right. and sits above a the equivalent of kind of a Department of Justice, right? right? So this wasn't just a prosecutor. This was their equivalent of the attorney general. Right. 
Why was it such a big deal to get Shokin out? Rewind the tape a little bit. So right after the Maidan, as a condition of Western aid, there's a lot of anti-corruption reforms that Ukraine is supposed to engage in. Among them was to stand up this new investigative entity called NABU, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine. Right. Which you was, can remember that. Yeah, NABU, which, right. NABU, right. Which was an investigative unit, right? right. So this not a prosecutorial unit, an investigative unit, right? So right. to basically unearth all of the corruption. But then they had to hand files over to someone who would actually prosecute the cases, right? right. That's where the prosecutor general's office uh, okay. came in. So there was a sense that there was a lot of rot in the prosecutor general's office, that there was a lot of not covering for corruption, maybe corrupt behavior itself within the prosecutor general's office. And that predated Shokin's arrival. Right. But Shokin becomes the prosecutor general, I believe, in the spring of 2015. The problem was that there were some good deputies within the prosecutor general's office who wanted to investigate cases. But Shokin was systematically marginalizing and pushing those people out. Meanwhile, there were some low-level prosecutors who themselves were found to be quite corrupt. There was a famous case involving, I think, the security services of Ukraine doing a raid on the house of a prosecutor and finding a bunch of diamonds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. I remember that, yes. So there's a couple things. Shokin Associates themselves appeared to be corrupt, and he was clogging up the system such that corruption files couldn't go forward because right. they'd get stuck in his front office. They'd just be in a file in a drawer somewhere. And nobody was ever prosecuted no, of any nobody. significance. So the sense was, not only in the U.S. government, but in the EU and the IMF, that Shokin had become kind of a single point of failure. Yep. And this goes back to the he-we distinction. So the notion of getting rid of Shokin doesn't emanate from Vice President Biden. You start to hear calls from this from our State Department in the fall of 2015, first by Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt, who's now our ambassador in Greece, I, Greece. I believe, yep. but Greece. at the time was our ambassador, a great, well-respected yep. foreign service officer, yep. who gives this big speech in September saying you can't fix corruption in Ukraine unless you reform the prosecutor general's office, right. and essentially firing a shot across the bow of Shokin saying, shape up or you're going right. to have to ship out. And just to underscore, just because these yeah. are confusing things, ambassadors also are not just freelancing. Right. He's making that speech because you all in the interagency decided that this was Obama administration policy towards Ukraine. That's right. A few weeks later, Toria Newland, who is kind of our firecracker of an assistant secretary for Europe, gives testimony to the Congress to the same effect. So right. it's a little bit weird. You know, the impeachment inquiry very much looks like a play that president and his personal lawyer do that kind of ropes in the State Department right. for a personal agenda. That's kind of the inquiry that's being focused on right. here. Here, actually, it's our State Department that's taken the lead in basically making the argument that if we're going to go forward with this anti-corruption mission, you have to reform the prosecutor general's office. And ultimately, that probably means getting rid of this guy, Shokin. Right. So it's really the state of the professionals in the State Department who are doing this. So Pyatt gives that speech in September. Toria Newland gives that speech in, or that testimony in October. Fast forward to December, Vice President Biden is traveling to Kiev. And, and you're on that trip. I'm on that trip. We had a Ukraine specialist on our staff, and right. we also had Ukraine specialists on the National Security Council staff. Right. But I kind of oversaw right. all these engagements. That's my job. The goal of that trip was kind of twofold. One was to give a major speech to the RADA, the Ukrainian parliament, to show U.S. solidarity with Ukrainian democracy reform, independence, sovereignty. I would strongly encourage those who are interested in this to go look up the YouTube it's speech. So. It's a really powerful speech. And Mike, you and I have been in a lot of rooms where presidents and vice presidents give speeches and there's like polite applause at the end. And it's very, yeah. this was like standing ovation, really? tears coming down people's eyes. Like wow. it was this powerful sign of solidarity. That okay. was thing one. I'm going to go look it up. You Thanks should, you should go do that. Down. The, but the second piece of business was the kind of the encounters with Poroshenko and Yatsenyuk, and especially with Poroshenko about the president of Ukraine, the president of Ukraine, about the conditions for securing a one billion dollar loan guarantee from the United States, as well as some additional financial assistance from the IMF. We had a long list of conditions. One of the big ones was reform of the prosecutor general's office. Right. And these weren't conditions that Joe Biden thought up. These were conditions right. that emerged out of this NSC Process, process that we about. talked about at the beginning. Right. So we're flying over to Kiev and we're talking about the speech and we're talking about the loan guarantee. And the vice president is getting briefed by his advisors, but also by Assistant Secretary Newland. And then when we land by Ambassador Pyatt. And the vice president basically says, look, I'm just going to tell Poroshenko that you're not getting the money unless you fire Shokin. And mm -hmm. the reason why the vice president decided to make it that stark was that he believed we were never going to have the kind of leverage we had right now that Poroshenko could do everything else on the list, 
but we were in wide scale agreement that if Shokin was still there, it wouldn't, wouldn't mean right. very much. Right. So this was the moment to apply that leverage, especially because Poroshenko was receiving a similar message from the Europeans and from the IMF. Right. In fact, I think for your listeners who are interested, there was an LA Times story a couple of days ago now where Poroshenko actually was on the record saying that this wasn't something that Joe Biden was pushing him on. It was something that everybody, everybody was, was pushing him on. And by the way, a footnote to link to our previous yeah. podcast. So was Ukrainian civil yes. society. Sasha Ustinova, who joined us the last time on World Class, she was actually recounting that they had demonstrations yes. outside of Shokin's office. Imagine Americans demonstrating against the Attorney General. That's how big an issue this was, was in society there as well. It was. And, and, you know, every time that Biden traveled to Ukraine, and I was on the trip in November of 2014, and then on this trip a little more than a year later, he would meet with both civil society activists and uh -huh. also kind of new reform-minded RADA members. Yep. This was a policy that the international community was in support of, but so were Ukrainian reformers. Right. But it was also something that I think we understood as a government and the vice president understood this well because he talked to President Poroshenko so often that it was really hard for Poroshenko to do. And I think in large part because Shokin was one of these guys who knew where all the bodies were buried. Sure. And the entire foundation of Ukrainian politics is highly entangled with these oligarch relationships and their patrons of political parties. And right. there's some corrupt, shady stuff going on in the background. And so it's politically risky to do a bunch right. of big, high-profile anti-corruption cases. And so I think it's precisely because the vice president understood that Poroshenko might not otherwise be inclined to do this politically difficult thing right. that he made, the, I think, the proper judgment. and He had to make it stark. That, right, that he had to make it stark. So right. he tells Poroshenko that in December. I think Poroshenko was a little disappointed because he thought he was going to get the billion dollars on the right. trip. And it was going to be a big deliverable. You know, right. these trips are all about deliverables. Yep. And the vice president was like, sorry, buddy, it's not going to happen unless you move aside Shokin. Poroshenko wasn't ready to do it in that moment. Mm -hmm. The two of them meet again a few weeks later at the World Economic Forum in Davos in Switzerland. So that's January of 2016. Then they talk repeatedly on the phone over the next few weeks. Unlike the current administration, we try to read right. out all our calls. I think we right. did. They're still available online if you want to check it out. We also didn't put any of these call records in a super secret uh, compartmentalized server as far as I know. But in any case, all these calls are on the record. You finally get by mid-February Poroshenko calling for Shokin to leave. He's dismissed by the president, but then like shows back up to work right. a couple weeks later, yeah. which is weird. Didn't and I still don't go, completely right. understand it. And the RADA then votes him out. Right. So that mid-March, he's finally, finally gone. And then a couple weeks later, Poroshenko goes in Washington, D.C. for the Nuclear Security Summit, meets with Biden and with Obama, gets an attaboy. And there were still a number of things on the IMF checklist he needed to uh -huh. do. And then once he did that, it unlocked the $1 billion. So I think hopefully that describes that this is, again, not a he story. It's a we story. Yeah. That is the State Department's all in on this. The White House is right. all in on this to include the president, the Europeans, the IMF, Ukrainian reformers. Right. So I think one of the things that is unfortunate about how the media has talked about it is they like to tell stories through people. Yeah. And this isn't a Biden story. It's this is a U.S. government story. So last question. He's yeah. replaced by a guy named Yuri Lutsenko. Yeah. What do you remember about how you reacted to that as an administration? So what I remember was that it was a combination of kind of consternation, but a little hopefulness. That right. is, my recollection is he didn't have a legal background, he and didn't. they actually had to change the law, I think, to, to allow him to, to be a prosecutor That's general. Correct. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think there was hope that he would nevertheless be committed to kind of an anti-corruption platform. Right. And initially, it looked like that. In fact, the company that is very much in the news, Bursama Holdings, this natural gas company, initially, Lutsenko actually reopens the case against it, Bursama. Right. And I think one of the things about that's odd about the kind of Trump Giuliani narrative about Biden is that not only was there no conflict of interest because the vice president was advancing the national interest, not a personal one, but even if there was a personal interest, he was acting against that interest because it was Shokin wasn't investigating Bursama and replacing Shokin with anybody who was more interested in anti-corruption and actually increased the risk right. that the Bursama case would be reopened. So it's kind of upside down and backwards and inside right. out like a lot of things are these days. But nevertheless, so Luzinko initially reopens this case. I think then a court dismisses it in the fall of 2016 is my recollection. But then fast forward again to kind of late 2018, early 2019, and both Luzinko and Poroshenko are kind of scrambling to stay in power, right? There's a presidential election coming up in early 2019. This is when Lutsenko starts to have conversations with Giuliani right. and starts to float the idea of maybe reopening this as part of an arrangement with the current administration that would earn them political favor. Right. And therefore either help 
Poroshenko win if he could show that he's close to the Trump administration, or if Poroshenko didn't win, Lutsenko could keep his job under right. a new presidency. Neither one of those things happened, right? right. Poroshenko doesn't win and Lutsenko gets ousted. And the second he gets ousted, Lutsenko essentially recants everything he said and says, actually, we looked into it and Hunter Biden didn't there. do anything. And there's, there's no there there. Right. Anyway, I think some of our hopes about Lutsenko being kind of a non-politicized reformer were kind of dashed by right. what happened afterwards. Yeah. Well, now they have a new prosecutor general and a new president. We'll see if they can actually, you can't ever defeat corruption, but take it on head on. This is the thing. It's very much in the U.S. interest to advance anti-corruption efforts around the world. Right. Because corruption is corrosive to stability, and it's also a, something that our authoritarian adversaries exploit. Right. You know, the, it is in the U.S. national interest to combat corruption. It's probably not in the U.S. Well, it's definitely not in the U.S. national interest to use official offices to put pressure on foreign countries to investigate political opponents under the fig leaf of corruption. That's probably not all right. Our framers were very worried about that type that's of right. entanglement between right. presidents and foreign powers. Right. And so that's really very much what the impeachment inquiry will decide, whether there was an abuse of power in this domain. I just hope that people can separate what's in our national interest from what might be in the personal interest of particular politicians going forward. Because what I would hate would be for all of this, for the collateral damage to be that somehow the United States shouldn't combat corruption around the world. Of course we should. Of course we should. And as you and I both did, when you put up your hand and take a, the oath to serve in the government, you take, I'm going to paraphrase it here, but to defend against enemies foreign and domestic, you didn't take an oath to defend Joe Biden or Barack Obama. Nope. And Constitution and our national interest. Yeah. We'll get back to that. Thanks, Colin, for being here. We're going to have you back. This is a hard, complicated story, so I'm sure we're going to have to take another bite at the apple the further we get into it. Sure. Happy to. You've been listening to World Class from the Freeman Spokely Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. If you like this episode, please review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps new listeners find the show. And be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on what's happening in the world and why.